R4, R13, or anti R5 works better in different endotypes. Similarly, with the development of biologics that are moving through now, we have those endotypes available. That's got a position as well with pharma as well to start to look at doing studies in those various endotypes to be able to look at the efficacy of those biologics in the treatment of their disease. So that's how I kind of see that aspect of it. Is that the answer? Yeah? So, just a question or comment on, on that. You're comparing asthma to, to food allergy, and I think that we certainly made lots of leaps and bounds, and people were talking about it and types of asthma, but I would venture to say that they are hardly well defined, hardly well understood, and work's been going on for a long time. There's huge redundancy, and there are a substantial minority of patients who look like they have a, have an endotype and a phenotype that should be amenable to a biologic, and 30 to 40 percent of patients won't respond to those drugs. So my question to you about the food allergy endotypes is where is that uh, research? So how much discovery really needs to go on before you can even begin to talk about meaningful endotypes, and is you know how much time is it going to take you to get there? Is, there a, is that a wise investment? Is there interest there? I, I just don't know. I'm asking, but I, just the analogy to asthma, I'd say, is that's still in its infancy, and there's been a lot of work. Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's got to be a, there does have to be significant more. Um, investigation of food allergy per se um, in, in stratification of these potential endotypes. But I think, for example, uh, not necessarily food allergic, non-food allergic, but IgE, for example, levels, um, where you have individuals that are food allergic with high IgE and low IgE, that, for example. Um, and we would need to test simple questions um, in regards to that. I think that we're going to need a, a, a period of time to uh, develop these registries um, to accumulate these samples and, and see what the data spawns out. Um, you're 100% correct that I don't think we're going to delve into um, pharma-driven trial in these endotypes in year one or year two. Uh, absolutely not. But I see later on once we've developed these and there's more maturation of food allergy um, and continuation like for, in the LEAP study and the EAT study that we see now that certain individuals where IgG4 goes down and that doesn't seem to correlate with, um, with uh, uh, desensitization such. Why is that? So can we see that there's another group where that doesn't occur? So based on that emerging data, we can generate hypotheses from that to look at that. But you're right in that that's not something we would look at immediately because we have to, that data is not yet available. Okay. Yeah. So following up on Yushi's question, Carolyn's question, one way that a center can gain more prominence is to start getting in program type grants, user or P's. Uh, how far do you think we are from being able to apply for something of that order? Uh, what area do you think we're currently strongest in that might be a good focus to try to build on? And what additional resources do you think we would specifically need to uh, have the best chance for uh, going after such a uh, project grant? So I think that the project grant, um, or like the, an example would be a larger multi-center involvement, COFAR, for example, what would we need to do? Um, as you know, I'm a, a member of the, um, the new SEP uh, study section in regards to mucosal immunology and allergy. And, and it's very evident, um, serving on that study section, that a priority is translational, translational research, the translation of um, studies. So any animal-based study, it's paramount that you have that translational validation aspect. Um, and I think that we do very well. We're, we, we're nationally, internationally renowned for our basic research program um, in regards to food allergy research or TH2 immunity. Um, but I think what we need to do better is to create that bridge um, that enables us to translate um, those observations uh, and show the existence of these um, cell populations or epigenetic differences or goblet cell energy passages that we observe in our various model systems actually do occur in humans. Um, in human tissue, as Patty would say, uh, or actually in humans. But um, I think that that's what we really need to build. Um, in, and 
if we can build that, and our strength, I think, is in discovery of new immune molecular pathways that drive food allergy, whether it drives sensitization or drives severity of disease, or like your work, for example, can prevent uh, allergic reactions. That's our strength there. Uh, but I think being able to have um, developed these repositories and so forth will enable us to validate these observations and provide some translational data that will then solidify our opportunity to go for these larger grants. And that also, I think, is also applicable to the small project grants, but the larger grants. In regards to, um, regards to the national stage, in regards to the COFAR will probably be considered the preeminent food allergy um, multi-center ongoing research program, or, uh, clinical research program. I think that we, d developing, um, getting on that stage or getting to that table is going to be very important. Um, how are we going to do that? And I think that um, the way to do that is standardizing uh, approaches in regards to oral immunotherapy, generating patient cohorts and so forth, and having a, a demonstrated history of um, publications and research in showing that we have the existence of these, um, these cohorts um, will be very important in permitting us to get to that table. So that's what I see the aspects we need to further develop. And we have, getting back to the resource aspect, we have some of those resources here now. Uh, and I think there's areas that um, we need to invest more to expand. Um, and there's other areas where I think that we need to um, recruit outside um, in regards to the things I've described uh, to develop those things better. Does that get to your question? Can you give some examples? Oh. Well, I think what I hear you saying is that you, you feel that we're in a reasonable position maybe 80% of the puzzle already for, for moving towards our program project grant? Is that what you're saying? Sure. So what pieces specifically are missing? Well, it, it, dep it obviously it depends on the project. Let's, for example, pick on... Let's Choose pick on one. That's what I'm asking. Choose one. What's really near and dear to your heart? What would you love to do if okay. you had a budget that was substantial? Forget all the food allergy center. Just focus on what kind of PPG you would love to put together and fund you know, don't, for, don't worry about the rest of it. So, so I think that the one example PPG is related to food sensitization. Um, I think that the one of the things that we would uh, want to look at is, for example, how do, how do we initially induce that type 2 immune response that sets everything on its path? And that, I think, is important to have the three critical elements, the basic uh, translational cl clinical program for the program project. Uh, and let's, for example, pick um, a, a project that we have in the lab in regards to goblet salinity passages. We can, show in, we can show in mice that this is a, a conduit for where food antigens actually cross the epithelium. We have evidence that this is presented to dendritic cells and can induce type 2 responses. Uh, Dr. Noah uh, in the lab has been able to show that under various conditions we can uh, ex expedite this process, slow this process down, and in fact, if we block it in mouse models, we can prevent a food allergic reaction from happening. So let's just set that as our scientific premise for the investigation. Then we would have, for example, what additional other things, so if we're talking food sensitization, that we're talking T cells, we're talking ILC cell populations. Um, and I'm going to refer to Yushi. Um, we have one of the most preeminent human allergic T cell biologists in the country. Um, and integrating um, and having y Yushi's expertise integrated into that in regards to sensitization, what's happening in regards to the cell populations we're observing, and then marrying that with validation translational analysis of yes, the innate in, in, um, mucosal mast cell population that we think drives the IL 9 and the and the phenotype um, in the mouse, we can see those populations uh, in, in human patients. And Yushi's already initiated that, um, and that's going forward. Well, what I think we need to do is expedite that, and but we've got to be able to power, we've got to increase the power of this by looking at specific populations. We can't be looking at some cow's milk, some, um, some peanut allergic uh, individuals, some are in, uh, a remission, for example, or some have multi-food sensitization. If we develop um, a, a cohort that is specific and power the studies enough, we can create validation analysis, which I think will be important, 
um, for growth into those, um, providing the preliminary data to support the scientific premise for those type of applications. And then if we have um, married this in with we have the um, immune cell aspect and we can show that antigen crossing the epithelium by this pathway develops the type 2 allergic marsh that we observe and uh, this occurs in the skin and, and the gut and the lung uh, and driving this cascade and we got validation in patient cohorts uh, that these pathways are in existence and association studies showing they're important but then being able to marry preventative approaches can we can we block these pathways uh, in systems um, and be able to show that that can prevent the onset of allergic reactions. So that's how I see coming together and that's a specific example. Two questions. The first one, scientifically, do you believe that breaking the sensitization pathways will uh, say that you're, if you break the sensitization pathways, the pathways of sensitization that you're going to learn through that project that you described, is going to help with the established food allergy and patient care? Ah, established food allergy? Yeah. No. Um, it, won't harm, it won't help in regards to desensitization. I would argue, and, and Takeo's data would argue, it would block a, you having a reaction, but it's not going to desensitize you. So one, and getting back to your point, would this help patients? Well, what we would argue that if you can actually provide a, um, let's just say, a compound that can block you actually having a reaction, then uh, Dr. Risman then will be excited about, well, if I know that I can treat this patient using oral immunotherapy, and, but I know they're not going to have a reaction, we could, you could utilize these oral immunotherapy approaches to try and then desensitize because you're not concerned they're going to react. That would be kind of the big picture scientifically that we would kind of argue. But I, one of the things, in, if not only consistent, not only just within food allergy, but I, I'm not convinced that the evidence exists that we can switch a cell, a Th2 cell, to anything else. I think that we can suppress the cytokine production. I don't think we can um, uh, switch it to something else at this stage. So I think that the sensitization, immune sensitization, is a different is a different question, um, and I don't think that approach would block that. The second question, how do you see uh, the measurement of efficacy and success of the center? And let's say the milestones. Sustainment is the, pri is the primary thing. If we, can, if, if we can 10, 15 years time show that the program uh, is continuing and continue to grow, sustainment, to me that would be uh, demonstrate success. Now that you may consider that as being s small, but actually for you to be sustainable, means you're achieving a lot of these other metrics. For you to be sustainable, you've got to have an income stream that's going to be both clinical stream um, and you're also going to have a research stream. If you've got a research stream, that means you've had success, you've generated data, you've submitted grants, you've got grants funded, sustainment. If you look at, um, if you've got ongoing pharmaceutical trials that have, that have um, that are lining up to get, um, to treat your, uh, to look at doing studies with you, that means you've developed a reputation, a reputation of excellence. They want to work with you. Um, so again, um, that is, if you can show sustainment, you've achieved that goal. And also on the clinical side, if you've got an ever-growing um, patient cohort, word gets around in this day and age with um, the, uh, the multimedia and Twitter and all that, and, and parent uh, advocacy groups, if they hear of, um, of institutions that are doing excellent work or having greater efficacy in treatment of their patients, they swarm to those places. Again, if you're, if you're having sustainment, you must be doing that. So that's why I think sustainment is, a, is an important indicator of a milestone of success. I think it's really interesting that you use sustainment as a, as a milestone and a measure of success. And, and how you explained it was good. I, I can't argue with that. I agree. What would you say would be your biggest hurdle to doing that, and how are you going to overcome it? Um, being a PhD. Um, it's, I'm going to be dependent on uh, having a relationship uh, 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 with a clinical director um, that I'm going to be very dependent on. Um, and that's going to be, I think that's going to be a core um, 
marker of success, if we can, as I said before, if we can um, establish that, I think um, that's, a, that's a significant battle won. Um, I think that the, I don't, have any, I don't have any problem not knowing certain things. I don't have any problem um, taking advice from people. Um, I like to take advice from people, but I think that I've got to establish, I've got to be able to develop a rapport, not only with the clinical director, but other providers, um, that we uh, have a common goal, uh, that I am facilitating uh, ideas and things that they're interested in doing, uh, and that may relate to improvement of patient care, for example. Um, so I think that's um, going to be a very important um, aspect. I like the vision about the uh, close collaboration of PhD and MDs on the task force, and this is a huge strength of this center. Uh, clinical trials may be one of the options, like you mentioned, uh, where you can bring the translational research in the close collaboration between each other. What's your vision? And you mentioned that uh, are we in the center is on the good level of uh, clinical trials, clinical uh, sort of collaboration, or it should be improved, and if yes, in what direction? I don't, I don't think it should be improved. I think it's going very well. Dr. Assad's involved in a, a number of um, multi-center ongoing trials now. Um, with, uh, I, we were at the Academy meeting recently, DBV Technologies were everywhere, and they're having great success with their patch, and we're involved in those things. I'd like to expand them. It's not that I think that I, th I think they're doing great. I just I think we need to invest more. And when I say more, that means provide protected time for the providers to get involved in that um, in doing that more. Um, so there's the issue of the business analytics um, that I've kind of learning about um, in regards to uh, the providers. They have metrics they have to meet with RBUs and so forth. So being able to um, facilitate uh, them, giving them protected time to be able to initiate these studies and get involved in these studies. There's an advantage, um, it, once we get them up and running, that will provide its own clinical stream, but we need to invest initially pr and pr protect these individuals to enable them to, get, to expand these uh, studies, but also provide the clinical infrastructure. It's going to be important that we'll dedicate clinical research coordinators, for example, um, to those respective studies initially, and that investment will reap threefold, fourfold later on because we'll get return in revenue that, um, that will then cover that. Anything else? I think we're at the hour. Anybody else has one last question? Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I will around a couple of times. Huh?